Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you dial in from. Welcome to our second of our three-day webinar series on the multilateralism and diplomacy in a post-COVID world, hosted by RSIS. My name is Frederick Lim, and I'm with the Center of Multilateralism Studies at RSIS. Although we are still in a very much in the middle of COVID, it might, may be, it might, might be a bit odd to speak about a post-COVID world, I guess, still being in the, right in the middle of it. But allow us perhaps now a year or so in, maybe a bit more than a year in, to uh, draw some preliminary conclusions of COVID, of a global pandemic we have never seen before uh, in this, to this extent, and also allow us some predictions, some informed predictions on the experience we've had uh, so far. So last week at our first uh, uh, edition of this three-day series, we looked at uh, great power competition and COVID. And uh, this week we will zoom in uh, on uh, trade, multilateralism and geoeconomics um, a bit closer. Very specifically, we will speak um, about COVID and how it relates to three themes, which is ASEAN and centrality, uh, regional geoeconomics and the BRI and regional uh, trade. So for this, I have with me an all-female panel of excellent experts. Um, we're really grateful to have them uh, with us here on board. Uh, I will introduce them very briefly for longer. You will have all received uh, this invitation, and you will have a more detailed uh, bio on there. So uh, first with us, we have uh, Alitza uh, Kizekova. I'm sure I butchered the name. I'm sorry. Uh, she's the head of the Asia Pacific Unit and a senior researcher at the Institute of International Relations in uh, Prague. She's also a guest lecturer and a researcher at the Faculty of Society and Design at Bond University in Queensland, Australia, from where she joins us today, if I'm not mistaken. She's an expert on uh, regionalism and on ASEAN specifically, um, and she will speak to us today about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on ASEAN and ASEAN-led regional institutions. Next in line, we have Alisa Leng. She is a research associate in the power uh, and diplomacy program at the Lowy Institute in Australia. And she is uh, one of the brains behind the Asia Power Index, uh, an fun a fantastically educational tool, uh, which I suggest you check out um, on the internet, free of charge for everyone. This, this is possibly the most scientific um, gauge we have. Uh, for um, for estimating uh, for gauging the uh, regional balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, um, she will speak to us today about the impact of COVID-19 on regional uh, uh, geoeconomics and the Belt and Road Initiative. Last but not least, we have our very own uh, Lee Su Yun. She's an assistant professor here at RSIS, and she's an expert on IPE matters. She will speak to us about uh, the future of regional trade in a post-pandemic. Uh, world. So without much further ado, um, I introduce some housekeeping rules and then we hand over to uh, um, uh, Alitza. So we, each speaker will, sp uh, will speak for about 10, 15, 15 minutes roughly, and uh, um, then we will hand over to the next speaker. You, uh, the uh, distinguished audience, are free to enter your questions or comments in the chat and Q&A function. And uh, once our speakers are done uh, presenting, I will begin reading out your questions. Please state your name and your affiliation, if I may ask you um, for that. And um, I will uh, give you a shout and have your question answered. So please, over to Alitza for, her for, for the first presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introductions and uh, to RSI Singapore for organizing the event and um, connecting this way. I see that uh, attendees, uh, there's about 35 people and some friends also there. So I'm saying hi to people at RSI uh, where, where I had a chance to spend some time in the past. This topic uh, that I was given, uh, there were two specific questions, um, whether or not the pandemic has harmed ASEAN's regionalism and ASEAN's centrality. And um, I am of a view that um, we shouldn't necessarily um, overly criticize regional organizations and frameworks um, when they probably have not been utilized uh, to their full uh, potential, especially in the early stages of uh, pandemic. Uh, 
Um, we have European Union, which is uh, obviously supranational, more integrated, and that has not been without any faults. And so having expectations on ASEAN to act even in a more integrated and coordinated manner, I think sometimes it's a bit um, too much um, when we compare it to other more integrated uh, collaborations. Um, saying that, I think ASEAN uh, and ASEAN-led um, frameworks have experienced certain setbacks uh, and kind of lost of uh, momentum, which I think is very hard when you finally get to some stage of uh, interactions, especially when it comes to economic security and political integration and um, synchronization of some projects that are supposed to improve connectivity, um, especially in border exchanges, in security questions. And I think that's the major uh, misfortune uh, right now, the loss of momentum, um, because what happens here with the governments, uh, and, I'm, and I'm going to tackle first, obviously, the ASEAN's uh, efforts uh, first, but then I'll tackle some issues uh, because in my view, the criminals, the tr transnational crime, these people involved in such activities, they do not rest. They utilize the moment of distracted leadership, uh, which might be rightly uh, distracted and they will uh, use opportunities to cause more damage and, and find ways to operate um, on a larger scale. And we have groups that are extremely vulnerable. So that's another one of my focus areas. And we also have unpredictable situations of natural disasters that we have to focus on in terms of, um, we have to be ready. The readiness, preparedness has to be there. And the last point that I'll make today will be about ASEAN actually being, um, I think, strongly placed as a stabilizer for the region, Asian and Indo-Pacific, uh, since that has become our focus area, uh, because that's a meeting place for, you mentioned the great powers, but also regional players that are not great powers. It's, it's an element of stability that we, we need. We need this sort of reference point we need a place that um, has been there for a while. I mean, ASEAN has provided, um, I think, uh, interactions uh, in informal and more formal way. Um, I can say, I guess, since 1980s onwards, more dynamically since 1990s, 2000. So it is, it is a place that helped to socialize uh, countries to cause of conduct. So when it comes to the setbacks, I had a look um, what is impressive actually, a lot of countries are now generating studies. Um, I have to actually give credit to a few authors, I'm not going to name them, there's eight, who published an article in Progress in Disaster Science uh, just uh, last year in fall um, of Australia, summer, um, on COVID-19 and ASEAN responses, comparative policy analysis. I'm not going to deal with the content now, but there is a lot of information now about specific countries, responses. So we have these comparative studies about what was done, whether there were lockdowns, whether it was business as usual. So that's something that is available. And we've got tables, we've got um, uh, specific examples of what the issues were. So I don't think that's really necessary to overanalyze. We just need to update it, keep an eye, and uh, probably start to look into some base, base uh, practices so we can exchange because especially countries who had the, I would say sometimes luxury to shut down their economies um, and not necessarily focus on the economic recovery immediately. Um, they can uh, provide information on the uh, tracking and, and um, tracing uh, and gradually testing and, and vaccination availability. There are countries who did not have that opportunity especially when they were in more rural areas and also depending on workers who are working in more informal manner and there is a strong poverty. I'm not going to give uh, examples of countries. I don't think it's my um, place to provide peer review right now when we are all still um, struggling with finding the best solutions, but that information is available. Those peer reviews and comparisons are available. Um, and I think uh, ASEAN 
was tested on some of the major visions, uh, having one solution or uh, for ASEAN as a whole, like regional, um, region-wide solution. And what I understand from my side is that for at least five months, uh, governments in Southeast Asia focus really internally on their national responses as they so fit. And I think that's uh, something that is not a flaw of ASEAN, it's a natural response and it's a state's, I think, uh, primary function to protect the citizens and work with the mechanisms. Saying that ASEAN has the mechanisms uh, in place um, because experience pandemics in the past, we had uh, SARS and others, and, and this kind of, um, I, be I believe there is evidence from at least five last 20 years of um, what has been done and, and responses. So those uh, frameworks are in place. They have to be utilized, but I think what's not in place is, is the capacity uh, for governments to actually have a uh, stable and ready healthcare systems. And they are, there is such a difference in uh, countries. And I think that's where the, the focus should be uh, to strengthening um, and have this health security of healthcare, health, healthcare workers, but also provide trainings, campaigns, um, and equipment that is necessarily uh, required. And this doesn't have to necessarily only come from internal ASEAN uh, flow of exchange, but also from outside countries that are so dependent on the solutions. Um, I would say another issue that I noticed is, as I mentioned before, the implementation of some of these um, uh, synchronizations when it comes to connectivity. Um, has been put on hold. There were some success stories, as I understand, with upgrading the ground uh, transport links and road networks. Uh, some of them came from connectivity projects also linked to, it's my understanding, to China Belt and Road Initiative. And, and that's interesting to analyze how much there is dependency on those fundings and whether there will need to be some reassessment and look inward within the ASEAN space, whether some collaborations can be done to continue with these um, connectivity projects. Um, because I think that would be a shame to um, give up right now. And also trade barriers um, behind the borders have been eliminated in some uh, cases, but countries will become more, um, I think, uh, anxious about their economic uh, reconstruction and they will be looking into where they can get extra funding, even if they have to um, possibly um, deal with more trade barriers um, in the past. Well, it is my understanding that a lot of pressure now will be put obviously um, on countries such as Brunei that would be in the, um, or are in the leadership chairs and um, others that come after. And so we are really focusing on short-term and medium-term solutions here. And as I mentioned before, um, uh, lots of the um, trade and, and flows um, and income uh, and revenues in this part of the world come from tourism, manufacturing, but also labor migration. And I think uh, countries will be anxious about reopening borders, allowing these workers to, to operate. Um, but some of them that might be stuck in countries are very vulnerable. And as I mentioned, um, this is the stability that is necessary right now, because if you overlook these groups, there could be some discontent and uh, um, even um, possible protests. Um, that, that is very possible these days. People are, on, people are on edge. They are struggling and there is unemployment. And so I think ASEAN's role and, and which is why I don't believe that ASEAN really was harmed, is provided stability um, of, let's say, waterways, um, because that obviously is the vital um, role for the region in terms of um, prosperity and exchanges um, for exchange of goods, but also movements of individuals, making sure that uh, the, the laws of sea are still um, preserved and uh, monitored because we don't want to see any exploitation um, of a human um, 
potential there in terms of human um, trafficking, but also by other countries uh, possibly using these distractions as a way to operate in a manner that might not be within the guidelines of um, free and open seas. So the, these kind of irregular migration issues uh, that might uh, come up, people smuggling, including uh, modern day slavery, but also states uh, misbehaving, um, that can destabilize the region and make the overall response uh, for ASEAN and ASEAN-led or uh, structures even harder. Uh, with the economic recovery, as I mentioned before, uh, ASEAN has been quite focused on the connectivity agendas and uh, supply chains. And I think this is very important to continue and making sure that it works on, on um, these projects and focuses on those projects, how to restart them and, and uh, facilitate uh, these exchanges even more. Um, what uh, is, I think, uh, quite relevant also when, when it comes to ASEAN centrality, um, I think is to find a way how to um, have a united narrative. I think lots of the public is very confused about their own government's uh, messaging. And I think it's the role of ASEAN to find people or user-friendly, people-friendly way to really um, provide um, information that helps as to where we're going next, because people understand where, where they're now and what happened. And, and I think they really wanna know some guarantees that some things that were in place before, because we live in a new sort of way, new, new world, uh, but they need to know that there is some reference point that they can actually feel comfortable. There is some stability. And I think this kind of messaging um, from um, ASEAN can be quite useful. Also, um, I think in engaging uh, countries on those best practices and finding gaps and uh, trying to facilitate those uh, interactions because it can act about the state's uh, interest in this regard as a facilitator and, and some sort of a fixer, if I can actually use that term, uh, because those administrations uh, domestically might not see those uh, policy networks that are in place um, and are need to be utilized. Um, I also will mention one point that I think uh, we shouldn't overlook with the great powers and the tensions ASEAN centrality really, I think, lies in some sort of a balancing um, position. Uh, it's been years since I've dealt with uh, Southeast Asia and the discussion about ASEAN just sometimes sitting and waiting what the great powers debate and then response. I think uh, we are a bit past that stage because the big players sometimes don't see eye to eye, regardless of changes of leadership in their countries. That's still their issues unresolved. And I think we need to hit the pause button and really reassess um, how much that interferes with the regional responses, how that's, that's a distraction. And I have to give a credit to Siseng Tan uh, because he wrote an article obviously about the multilateralism two plus or two old, sorry, and um, identified in his article, um, ASEAN is some sort of a balancer for Quad and uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. And I think that's the role that is necessary because nobody wants, nobody wants to see any um, tensions uh, between big players and visions, um, big, bigger regional visions. Um, so I think ASEAN can still fulfill that role as some sort of a player that can um, moderate uh, tensions and, and can provide that uh, um, sort of uh, not just listening ear, but also and uh, sort of um, advice in a way how to focus really on those, um, on that robust response that is now required uh, region wide. So I'll stop here. Um, I can answer some questions, but these are just some of my bigger points. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alisa. That was great. Uh, I agree with you that um, ASEAN was generally 
not harmed uh, so much because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, with COVID-19, I guess this is also probably because expectations are relatively low. Uh, people look to the nation state first and then uh, to ASEAN second, if at all. Right? Um, uh, the situation is a bit different in the EU, I guess, where one would say the EU has been harmed quite substantially by it because expectations are a lot higher. I really appreciate your point. You made um, ASEAN as a provider of unbiased and neutral information to the people. I think that's great. And this is really something that can be done. It's a very low hanging fruit. And yet uh, there's quite a high return if you consider that this is really the embodiment of an, a people-centered ASEAN, you know, what they always claim to be. Um, and this also would raise ASEAN's profile quite a lot, I guess, among uh, the citizens of Southeast Asia. So, so great. Um, okay, uh, let's move on uh, to uh, Alisa, please. The floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Frederick. Thanks so much, everyone else as well, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's great to be here. Hopefully, you are now seeing some slides. Yes, okay, that's good. All right, so um, I'm going to talk briefly today about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted on the geoeconomics of our region. And I'd like to make uh, three main points on this front. The first is that the different rates and scale of economic damage and different recovery profiles in countries around the region uh, will be changing the economic balance of power going forward. So the two most obvious ways that we can think about this uh, is in terms of the pandemic speeding up China's catch up to the US in terms of economic size uh, and the slowdown or the delaying of India's economic rise as a potential uh, economic competitor to China. And so that's the broad landscape in which we'll be operating in geoeconomically. And the second point that I'd like to make as well is that the tools of the geoeconomic game or the focus and what we're using uh, have changed for now. Vaccines are really a variable that we haven't talked about before, but of course are key to starting economic activity again uh, and have come to the fore, whereas trade and investment and the BRI and the like have, have sort of receded a little bit into the background. And uh, the last overarching point is that there are still some fundamentals that remain the same in spite of the COVID-19 shock uh, and, and how it's affected our geoeconomics and the region. And the most obvious point on this front is, of course, that China will remain very central to the geoeconomic story, uh, both because of its size and as well as the actions it's taking, particularly on the vaccine front. So rewinding a little bit and trying to remember back to what the world was like uh, before COVID-19, and geoeconomically, the landscape was very much dominated by China's rise, China's rapid growth and prolonged growth over a number of years. And you can see that on the left-hand side chart here, where China has made rapid progress in catching up to the US in terms of GDP. And if you can see on the chart on the right-hand side over here, it's not just that they're catching up, but it's the speed and the momentum of that change that really picked up around the period of the GFC, just before the 2010 mark, uh, on the chart there and has actually remained elevated since then. So that's the growth story, China growing and shifting economic weight eastwards um, towards Asia. And in tandem with this growth story, uh, we also have the story in terms of trade. Uh, and as China's growing, it's becoming more integrated into the rest of the world and the rest of the region. So if I click play on this little chart here, you'll see that throughout the 80s that most of the world was trading significantly more with the US than they were uh, with China. But as you'll see in the moment, again, this turning point occurs around the period of the GFC, after which significantly more trade integration occurs between China and the rest of the world. And the end result at, at, in 2018, at least, was that two thirds of countries in the world uh, actually traded more with China than they, than they did with the US. So we have here China, of course, a key geoeconomic player in terms of size and in terms of engagement, economic engagement with the border region as well as the world. And then we have COVID-19, of course, which hits, uh, which hits massively. Uh, let's see if I can, there we go, that's the next slide. Uh, we have COVID-19 coming, which of course uh, has inflicted significant economic damage across the region. And you can see that in the chart over here that no country in Asia and, of course, the rest of the world has been spared from this economic damage caused, as we know, by domestic lockdowns, uh, health restrictions uh, and also international travel restrictions and the external sector being slowed down by global supply chain disruptions. But 
this damage that has been caused by the coronavirus to countries has not been the same in every country around the region. So just to give two stark examples here, uh, you can see on the left here we have India, uh, one of the worst affected countries if you look at the downward revision of the 2020 GDP growth rate. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have China, uh, one of the least affected, still, of course, suffering some damage, um, but less affected than many of the other major or large economies uh, in the region. So that's damage, the economic damage uh, caused by the coronavirus. And now the flip side of that is one year on, we're now starting to turn our attention towards uh, economic recovery, as Alita mentioned before. Um, but the thing is with economic recovery, just as there were different rates of economic damage that countries sustained, is that countries are going to recover at different speeds and the profiles of those recoveries are going to change. So if you have a look at the chart here again, you see China in the bottom left corner, the only major economy in the region um, that, that is forecast to grow in 2020. Meanwhile, you have its other economic competitors, take the US, uh, India, and other major economies like Australia, Korea, and Japan, taking at least one to two years just to get back to where they were uh, in 2019. So China's recovery is clearly underway and it's clearly occurring faster than many of its economic competitors, if you will, around the region. Uh, and it's this, I think, that will, that will play into the broader landscape and change the economic balance of power uh, in the region. Because the first implication of this is that uh, the economic impact of the coronavirus uh, will accelerate the process of China catching up to the US in terms of economic size, in terms of GDP. Uh, and that's clear in that it has here a two year effective head start, if you will, two years where the US is getting back to where it was in 2019 while China grows. Um, so the arithmetic is just such that uh, China, China is speeding up and speeding ahead. And the other interesting uh, thing to consider here is, is actually India, who is the only uh, economic force or country with the demography and the scale uh, to match China in the future. Uh, and as you saw before, India was severely impacted economically as a result of the virus, and it will take a couple of years to get back to where it was in 2019. Uh, and this analysis, which also formed part of the Asia Power Index, uh, in there, we found actually that we suspect that India will only reach about 40% of China's size in GDP PPP terms by 2030, uh, rather than 50% as a direct result of the coronavirus and, and the sharp contraction that it experienced in 2020. So while I'm, there's of course uncertainty about how uh, economic recovery is going to play out and whether forecasts will change and so on and so forth. But of course, it makes it difficult to understate here how important China is going to be as a geoeconomic player and how the landscape around it is changing as a result of the coronavirus. So that's the big picture, uh, the big landscape in which we're all sort of operating in. Uh, but zooming in a little bit and looking towards now the specific geoeconomic tools and initiatives um, that have often been used by states in this, in this arena and how they fared with the pandemic, it's obviously the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, that is one of the main uh, mainstays uh, and, and is worth talking about. But largely, it seems to have been the case that the BRI is on hold uh, while COVID-19 takes, uh, takes the center stage. So the Chinese MFA has actually come out and said that about over half of BRI projects have been affected by coronavirus for all those reasons that I was talking about before, health measures, travel restrictions, um, difficulties getting inputs um, across borders because of supply chain issues. So that's the right now, um, BRI is sort of chugging along but having some issues just about uh, in a similar fashion to most things around the world. Um, but going forward, uh, but it, is, it's, it may be the case that there, be, there may be lower demand from host countries uh, for new projects going forward. Uh, we are seeing tightening fiscal conditions around many developing uh, economies around the world and around the region uh, and growing concerns around debt sustainability. And um, the, the BRI's focus on sort of long term and big infrastructure investments may not suit the, the mood right now of the here and now we need to get the economy started. And really that's where, uh, for me, vaccines start to come into play. And so vaccines are not, of course, not a typical economic or geoeconomic variable, but one that we are now very much having to discuss. Uh, given how important they will be in restarting economic activity going forward, as well as international travel and so on and so forth. 
Uh, and you can see on the chart on the left here that it's very clear that rich or developed countries are going to have faster and more widespread access to the vaccine uh, than developing countries in Asia as well as in Africa. And in many cases, those countries have struggled to secure supply from the likes of Pfizer and AstraZeneca after the, after these, the emergence of this vaccine nationalism uh, coming out of the EU and, uh, and a number of other developed countries. So it's striking that actually in a, in a dynamic not too dissimilar to the BRI, that it's actually China that a lot of these developing countries are looking to, to either supplement their supply of vaccines or as the primary provider. So if you look at the table on the right hand side here, uh, this, this is a list of countries who have agreed to buy or, or use Chinese made vaccines. Uh, so it is, it's of course vaccines, it's like having the power uh, to giving a vaccine that will restart or help restart a nation's economy is, is a vastly powerful tool. And China has shown that it's very, very happy and very engaged in terms of vaccine uh, diplomacy here. So again, this brings me back to the point where China is, of course, still going to be central in the geoeconomic landscape, not, because, not just because of its size, not just because of trade and investment links, but now also as a key supplier of vaccines to many countries in the region. So that's one thing that's staying the same. Uh, and just circling back to my point before, it, the, the broad contours of the geoeconomic landscape are likely to change as a result of economic damage and recovery, uh, all of which, of course, makes it very exciting to talk about geoeconomics and trade and institutions. Uh, so thanks very much for your time and for listening, and I'll look forward to the discussion uh, later on. Sorry, I just had uh, some microphone uh, issues. Uh, okay, thank you very, thank you very much, Alisa. That's great. It, it's really remarkable how much China actually benefits. If you think in in pure balance of power, um, uh, zero sum terms, how much China actually ends up benefiting vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis its peers, uh, economic geoeconomic peers, uh, from this uh, COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. Uh, um, I, I, I must say, I'm actually also a bit surprised that you said 50% of the BRI was, uh, is affected. I, I actually thought that was relatively low. I would have uh, expected um, uh, a lot more uh, effect on this. Maybe we can, dis can discuss this uh, later in the, in the Q&A as well. So um, now, now let, us, uh, um, let us go to our last but not least uh, speaker. So Yun, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully, I guess everybody see the first page of my presentation. So thank you very much for or having me today. And uh, it was my uh, great pleasure to be part of this webinar. And I, I really enjoyed you know, the presentations uh, uh, by our co-speakers. I learned a lot. Uh, I'd like to move our focus on the issues of the regional trade. Oh. Okay, so you know, as you know, the uh, trajectory of the COVID-19 is not known. So I guess I'm going to just you know, outline uh, three different you know, structural factors that might allow us to make a guess about the future direction of original trade, uh, especially with an emphasis on ASEAN economy. So, so first of all, I'm going to talk about the impact of the you know, COVID-19 on global and original trade. And then uh, describing you know, the impact of the US-China trade war or great power competition. And then later, uh, uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about you know, how the uh, regional trade orders have evolved you know, over the past uh, few decades. So as you might know, you know all the international organizations, including the WTO and the Bay, uh, IMF, you know, they have provided us in you know, a very uh, pessimistic forecast about the trade impact of the COVID-19. So for instance, the WTO annual trade outlook released uh, last April, they projected that trade would plummet by between 13 percentage or 32 percentage point uh, because of the EE COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, after six months later, they revised their forecast to say that, well, things might not be that bad, you know, actually uh, the forecast has been revised uh, to 9.2 to 9 fold in the volume of a world merchandise trade in the last year. And then maybe we might expect uh, a rise of a 7.2 percentage point this year. 
So mainly, this is because you know, many governments around the world are moving very fast with expansionary fiscal and monetary policies. But uh, I like to emphasize that still we are seeing a, 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 a huge degree of uncertainty and the downside risk. So the global output growth, the pace of trade expansion, especially the whole recovery procedures, will be conditioned by many factors, such as you know, the grade of the outbreak, or whether there is another series of the lockdown across the countries, or you know, the availability of effective vaccines or other medical treatment in short order. Uh, let me briefly outline how uh, COVID-19 has affected in you know, a regional or trade. Uh, one interesting part of the observation is that there are starkly EEE, stark differences across the regions uh, and the sectors in terms of the trade impact of the COVID-19. Uh, we have observed you know, stronger contradictions in trade in Europe, North America, especially in the United States. Uh, but at the same time, the declines in trade volumes in Asia were relatively modest. But still, uh, many Asian countries, you know, they have a pretty hard hit on exporting sectors. And we have seen steeper falls uh, in sectors, you know, integrated into complex value chains, such as electronics and the automotive products. And then service trade, they have been also adversely affected, you know, because of trade restrictions and the social distancing. This means that our low-income countries, which heavily rely on remittances you know, from our outside labor and the tourism, you know, they, they are having a really hard time uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, one interesting part is that while global trade is recovering very slowly, China is doing much better. Uh, their merchandising and trade has rebounded quite quickly, uh, mainly because of their successful control of the pandemic and are still appreciating currency. So we, we might want to think about why we are seeing um, such variations in the trade impact of the COVID pandemic across the regions and sectors. So one of the key features of the economic toll of the COVID-19 we can think about the supply uh, chain shocks. So this means that the production of inputs in one country, uh, which was China uh, uh, in previous case, stalled by the spread of the virus and then uh, followed by the quarantine measures, which were to stop or, or, or interrupt production activities in other locations that rely on uh, inputs from the affected region. So one example you can think is the uh, closure of you know, factories and facilities in Wuhan, Hubei province, China. And actually, you know, this is the place you know, called a, a China's motor city or China's Detroit. And then once they closed down their production facilities, what happened is the huge shortages of supplies in all the plants around the world, including GIA in Korea, Nissan, GM, or in you know, Fiat in Italy, everywhere. So, at the end, we see this possibility of supply chain contagion. So this is a new term. In, uh, narrowly, you know, it can uh, mean the impact of the China's supply disruption to manufacturing sectors in other countries. But then more broadly speaking, it means that the transmission of supply shocks you know, from one country to others or, or the spread of the economic shocks. Uh, another feature of the economy uh, toll of the COVID-19 will be the rise of protectionism. This is a bit different to what we have seen you know, from the US-China trade sanctions, because in this case, export bans rather than import restrictions. That is what most governments have been doing. Especially, we have seen that they are having a series of the anti-export medical supplies, personal production uh, equipment, Now I'd like to uh, briefly move on to the you know, second factor, which is the uh, US-China trade war. I guess you know, this is a very familiar story to all of you. And then, you know, of course, there has been a global impact due to the tariff escalations in the, between the two largest economies in the world. Uh, but uh, frequently, Trump's tariff of, uh, protection targeted each strategic ally, such as EU, Canada, Mexico, Korea, on national security grounds. So this, this is one of the you know, parts of the you know, Trump protectionism. 
So at the global level, uh, it was critically argued that the US China trade war will cause a synchronized slowdown of the global economy. But uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Biden, uh, Biden administration, we might see some slight tweak here. And then there are also uh, different speculations on the impact of the US-China trade war at the regional level. And then one of them is that some people wonder that maybe you know, the trade tension will benefit other countries, especially the US and ASEAN countries. Uh, especially the uh, U.S. is uh, China's specific trade measure will cause trade diversion, which will increase the imports from ASEAN countries in the EU to other parts of the world. And then also U.S.-China trade tension might will generate in a relocation of the foreign firms to China, uh, 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 I'm sorry, foreign firms from China to ASEAN economies, which means you know, more investment in the region. But uh, when we think about the net impact of the US-China trade war on ASEAN economies, we are starting to think about the you know, supply chain disruptions. So the reduction of the you know, Chinese exports to the US market, it could also come as a uh, adverse shocks to ASEAN countries because you know, they are exporting in you know, products or raw materials to Chinese manufacturing sector. Now, I like to uh, move on to the third layer of the structure, which is the uh, proliferation of the regional trade agreement or free trade agreement. So here, you know, we are at the uh, beginning of the multilateral trading system, symbolized by the general agreements on trade and tariff. But uh, over the uh, past six or seven decades, we see that the number of regional trade agreement and the uh, free trade agreement you know, has been skyrocketing. And interestingly, ASEAN as a unity, they are very active in catching up with this trend. And then since, it, uh, since it's establishment, uh, establishment of the ASEAN FDA in 1992, it has more FTAs with its dialogue partners, such as Australia, New Zealand, China, India, Korea, and Japan. And then uh, more recently, they are so successfully uh, signed on the uh, CPTPP and the uh, uh, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So maybe we might uh, apply that ASEAN is very eager to lower their trade barriers. But uh, one thing I'd like to uh, focus on here is that the nature of these trade agreements are not the same. So for instance, and we can think about to what extent they really pursue trade liberalization, which I, I label as steps here. And then at the same time, the flexibility. So all of these trade agreements differ in the sense that the extent to which an agreement constrains state behavior, or at the same time, to what extent countries are allowed to move away from the signed agreement. So if you look at the numbers are here, the most liberalizing trade agreement from the ASEAN side was the one signed with Australia and the New Zealand. But the other or, or FDAs, with China, India, and Japan, their level of adapts or, or a level of liberalization tend to be much lower. And then the major differences is to what extent this agreement have a specific provisions in with different issues, such as investment, services, procurement, competition, or intellectual property right. So this is the uh, annual trend of the all of the regional trade agreement FDAs or bilateral trade agreement in the world since the 1950s. So as I've shown, you know, the number has been drastically increasing. And then the depth or the uh, pursuit of the liberalization through a regional trade agreement has increasing consistently. But the, what I like to emphasize here is that ASEAN FDAs, you know, they signed a lot 
but the, their level tend to be much lower than the world average. I think you know, this symbols something between the government or maybe domestic interest group. And then another interesting feature here is that bilateral trade agreement individually signed by Singapore, Malaysia, or Thailand, they show much higher level of you know, trade liberalization than the ASEAN free trade itself. So here uh, uh, I am concluding. Uh, I, I guess I am raising a series of you know, uh, 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 different questions about which factors will matter more for the direction of the future trade in a post-pandemic world. Uh, one thing we might consider is a, uh, there will be a restructuring or shuffling of global supply chains. And here the US-China trade war and then the COVID pandemic itself, they will interactively affect the uh, uh, restructuring of the global supply chains here. Uh, the second structure point we might consider here is the possible return of the United States to multilateralism. All of us know that Biden will be very different from Trump, but it does not necessarily mean that US will come back as a really strong advocate of the multilateral trade uh, because we you know their own domestic factors. And then secondly, uh, the US-China trade tensions. There will be an expansion of tensions you know, from trade to non-trade issues, uh, a bipartisan consensus between Democrats and Republican parties on China will be also an important factor uh, that will affect you know, the directions of the CPTPP or the RCEP. And the last point I'd like to emphasize is that uh, many political leaders in ASEAN countries, you know, they have praised the RTAs or mega RTAs as a uh, uh, building blocks for multilateralism. But given the, in the current situation of the WTO and the, the necessity, uh, necessity for WTO reform, we might want to think about to what extent you know, they can interact uh, with each other and then contribute to the stability of the multilateral trading system. So I'm gonna stop here, thank you very much. So, so you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, quite amazing the, the heat map you had there, right? The, about the FTAs. Um, we speak so much of uh, our fear of, of protectionism, protectionism returning, but then if you actually look at your map, in the past 10 years, the free trade agreements have been exploded. So even yeah. if we go into some sort of re, uh, uh, protectionism, we probably still end up somewhere in the 2010 kind of level of protectionism. Uh, uh, so so I, uh, I think uh, uh, we can all uh, rest calmly. Um, one thing I wanted to say um, about the Biden uh, reversal of Trump's uh, policies that I have encountered very recently, a very interesting argument was that Biden is very unlikely to, re to um, um, roll back Trump's policies just unilaterally because he can he actually benefits he can only stand to win right he cannot be blamed for those protectionist measures and at the same time he can use rollbacks of those measures uh, uh, as a bargaining chip uh, with China that was a very interesting argument I came across uh, that maybe uh, maybe relevant here so th thank you all, all uh, to all of you for your for your great presentations uh, questions please fire them uh, uh, our audience uh, in our Q&A function state your your name and uh, your affiliation and uh, 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 fire off your questions and I read them uh, out loud uh, I will uh, probably start off uh, kick uh, kickstart the discussion here with a few questions uh, I actually have myself uh, uh, to our distinguished uh, panelists before I hand over to the audience. Um, we have about, oh, we have enough time, right? We have about 45 minutes, roughly 40 minutes for, for Q&A. So uh, that should be more, more than enough. So maybe I start in reverse, in reverse order. So you know, I start with you um, uh, as the last speaker, as the first to answer questions. Um, I, you spoke about of this uh, supply chain contagion. I thought that was a very interesting, interesting term. I hadn't heard uh, uh, like that before. Um, I have come across quite a few countries, quite a few analyses of countries that have argued that governments are now increasingly interested, in fact, uh, funding 
uh, their own companies to diversify their supply chains, right? And by diversifying their supply chains really means diversify away from China. Uh, don't be so overly uh, dependent. So we see Japan has come up with quite a big budget to, to, help, to assist their own companies to diversify away from China and support them in doing so. Germany, uh, uh, my own country, has been quite active in that. They haven't uh, put out a fund for this, but they have been calling on their businesses to diversify away from China. And then um, I believe that the new uh, buzzword here is China plus one, right? Companies don't really move away from China uh, immediately, especially in uh, more liberal market economies. It's very difficult for a government to force a company to, to uh, yeah, forcefully interfere in their business models, right? But they can incentivize. And the China plus one idea was really that they keep some, some uh, their business in China, but they uh, uh, basically replicate this in another country, possibly in Southeast Asia. Vietnam is mentioned quite uh, uh, quite frequently. So I, I was wondering, is this A, is this something that is new or have been this China plus one model, is that a, a result of COVID or has this been around for quite a while and I've just never come across it, which is probably, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, likely. Uh, and, and and second, what are your thoughts on this uh, uh, generally to you? Okay, so your second question is, so the first question is about the China plus one model and the second question is my thought. <laughs> Yeah, so the first, they were both the China plus one model, but the first question was, is this a result of COVID or has this been around longer? And uh, uh, the, the second question really is, what is your thoughts in general on, on this China plus one idea, on this diversification of supply chains? Is that is that necessary? Is that helpful? Is that too popular? Uh, I'm being honest here. I guess you know, I don't have a lot to comment on the China plus one model because you know, I'm still in my learning curve. But the one thing I can tell you is that uh, the government uh, industrial policy there is you know, huge variations across the countries. And then, as you said, you know, many countries, I think you know, they are trying to diversify you know, their industries in terms of global supply chain. Because once you got more integrated in the global supply chains, it means that uh, you will be more vulnerable in the case of the external shocks. And then, but I think you know, the model of the you know, China plus one, uh, might not be a, as always, you know, uh, easy one to be implemented, because uh, it will take some time to get the you know fruits of the such plans. And so you, you gave me the example of you know, Germany and uh, Japan, but uh, once you know they install such a funding, but I guess it will take at least in a few years for private sectors you know to relocate their uh, uh, production activities you know, from China to other countries you know, with a similar uh, uh, institutions. So I guess this is a bit only to, uh, 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 to product the uh, result of the outcome. And at the same time, I, I think maybe the example of the South Korea uh, might be the one uh, that allow us to evaluate, you know, the efficiency of the, you know, uh, China plus one model. Because I guess, you know, the Korea is one of the example that got hit pretty hard, you know, by the uh, closure of the factories or, or facilities in China. And the, all the political leaders know that we might need to diversify. But the problem is that there are other, you know, uh, security issues. And then in terms of you know, uh, diversifying the economy linkage you know, with China to other countries might not be that easier uh, than that. So I'm gonna stop here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, then uh, may I post a question to Alisa as well, uh, please, if that's okay. Alisa, I really liked your, the, the notion of uh, vaccines as a new instrument of of geoeconomics, as you as you put it at the beginning, or a new tool of geoeconomics. My immediate thought was, uh, that's great. That makes total sense. But there is two ways you can really use vaccines. Pro there are probably more, right? So there's one is you can you can basically. I mean, there was not really a market before, I guess, for 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 vaccines, right? So now you have this 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 probably permanent market because let's not kid ourselves. This is not going to go away for a long time, right? And vaccinations will have to adapt and we be reproduced and send around. So you can actually create a big, you, well, nature has created a big new market and now China or other countries as well uh, can, uh, can service this market, right? And make potentially quite huge profits from producing effective vaccines and distributing them and selling them, right? And the other way to use them is as a way to enhance your soft power, right? And it 
if we stay with the China example, which makes more sense here, I guess, it, to show that you really are a responsible great power and that you are a provider of global goods. For that, you would have to not necessarily sell them at a high price, maybe at production cost or something like this, or donate to developing in developing countries uh, and use them that way, right? So that way you would, this market would not really be there. It would not be a profitable market, but reward comes in other ways, right? So if that makes sense, uh, could you please uh, uh, tell me what is what is your thought? Well, what is going to happen? Is this, what what is your feeling? What is your sense? Which one of the two is going to be is going to be the the um, long term future of um, um, the vaccine market in this world? And if it makes no sense at all, what I've just said, please uh, say so, and I move on and shall be silent. No, no, I think it's actually it's really well put though, when you say a sort of permanent ongoing market for vaccines. And I think it's it's sort of a combination between the two that you put out there in that it's it's an ongoing source, uh, ongoing display of China's technological pro um, progress. So in, in one aspect, it displays uh, one of the, you know, the harder elements of their power and how that's increased. But of course, it pays soft power uh, dividends as well in terms of China is, is, is offered to come to the aid of countries who've, who've uh, suffered severe outbreaks or are unable to afford vaccines. So I definitely think uh, there's a bit of both going on there. Um, that's my that's my first thought. And, and it's I don't think it's necessarily that China... Uh, I mean, the difference, of course, with the Chinese vaccines is that many of them are being produced by state-owned enterprises rather than private companies, as we've seen with the Pfizer's and BioNTech and so on and so forth. So I don't think it's, uh, in, you know, off the top of my head, I don't think it's a question immediately of, of profit, but it's a, it's a geopolitical and a geoeconomic tool um, to... To gain to to gain influence in, in in the region in a very tangible way again similar to the BRI. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, our first speaker, Alitza. I uh, I've already mentioned that I thought it was a great idea to um to have this uh, uh, ASEAN as a referee. But I, I wonder if there are more if there's more uh, use for ASEAN here in this in in the sense that there could be. Um, there could be something to a way to restore or and at least ha enhance uh, trust in regionalism uh, uh, as a re uh, as a result of the pandemic and that would be perhaps a role for ASEAN in producing a more long-term strategy for pan pandemic preparedness and pandemic management as I just said before to Alisa as well I think this is not going to go away right and even if we get COVID under control um, uh, there is no reason to believe that this will be the last uh, major pandemic, right? We we, we will suffer from. So the, I, I wonder if there is a role for ASEAN and you knowing uh, knowing ASEAN and how it works. How, what do you think is ASEAN's ability to produce a uh, tangible and also useful, um, strategically coherent roadmap for? Both, I guess, for opening of, of of pandemic measures, of pandemic restrictions that have been have been put in place, so that there is some sort of coherence in the region in Southeast Asia in in terms of opening what we open first and last and so forth. And the second thing, a, a long term strategy for pandemic pre pre preparedness, right? So we saw, you know, um, um, uh, Malaysia closing the corsair with Singapore without much notice, uh, Vietnam closing borders and so forth unilaterally without much notice. So perhaps this is not exactly the best way to go, right? This seems to be a bit of a step work. Uh, stopgap measure perhaps ASEAN could come to some sort of agreement how do we go about once a new pandemic hits right or do you think ASEAN is, is simply not capable of this because uh, states will never will never reach some sort of consensus uh, uh, here what, what is your assessment of this well first of all uh, I want to thank the ladies for uh, their presentations I found that like you quite inspiring seeing some of the images and, and uh, in context um, um, second of all, um, well, it's interesting to ask for something tangible from a regional cooperation that's meant to be more, um, I would say, less binding in some ways. Um, what, what I think nobody wants right now is um, some sort of official line. Um, I think what's required is take this time to actually make some changes to blueprints that have been in place the last five years uh, because we already know some of those um, goals are not going to be achieved um, at the speed and to the level that they wanted. Uh, because if you require 
um, increased flow of goods and movements through borders and, and quite um, swift uh, shipments of cargoes, reducing times. If you're requiring, uh, that requires more time to check it. Uh, like with more, with more cargo, you don't really get a chance to be very thorough. But we are at the stage when we have to be thorough and check people and we have to check cargoes, even from the point of uh, infectious spread. So that it should be, you know, it's not losing face to acknowledge that that's not going to happen. And I think people will actually find that reflection refre refle uh, refreshing that you will acknowledge that it's okay not to stick to those uh, bold plans. And actually, we are considering anxieties in the border areas. And like you said, there is a reason why countries shut the border so fast, because that's the quick solution to um, not to have spread and actually control um, the hotspots. And so this is not something that's only happening in Southeast Asia. I mean, Australia, the states here shut the borders and we only have few cases. Queensland had six deaths since the beginning, but the borders are shut so fast with New South Wales. People from Sydney, hotspots cannot come sometimes, Melbourne. That solution is utilized even here. But the people are getting anxious because like you said, if it happens too fast, it's not so much between the states, but generally people cannot plan anymore moving between the countries. So I think, um, like you said, we need tangible results, but they are workable. Like don't have planning now that is a vision, but have something, it's okay to have work in progress and reassess uh, what can work and what doesn't work. I think you ask about the um, uh, mechanism for dealing with pandemics long-term. We do have, like I said, 20 years of data and, and you know, you can, you can have a evolution of, different uh, committees and frameworks that are in place. And we do have regional um, border managements in place that let's say individual countries such as Thailand uh, had to engage in with the international networks. So that's all in place already. I think it's just a matter of finding time pause and have that conversation because everybody is so, I think still working in the emergency mode and not really, like you say, in that reflective and constructive. And everybody is a bit sick of Zoom meetings, sitting there and you know having obsessive discussions. So I think this can be on a less, in the sectoral level, it can be on a less ranking um, sort of uh, paths. You don't have to have right away the top ranking officials to prepare the groundwork for this reflection and change of uh, roadmaps and blueprints. And to public to say, you know, we have done something that did not work, but we want to fix it. And I think that's what people want to hear. What specifically will make their lives easier? How will you deal with their works, work, workplaces that they are comfortable going back to work or actually being able to open their shops and so forth, you know, or when can they go to countries where they are normally working? So they want to have these answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I, I just always remain the eternal ASEAN optimist forever. Um, okay, so there are uh, many questions that have come in now, uh, by now, from our audience. And I would start with Alisa, please, because there are two questions for you here. And I will read them out, both of them, and then uh, uh, hand over to you to, uh, 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 for an answer, if that's okay. So the first is your example of the global financial crisis was mentioned there 2008, 2009 as a turning point uh, uh, for China. In, in, in many ways was 2008 a big uh, year for China, but uh, you mentioned specifically the countries uh, began to trade more uh, with China. And uh, the uh, Raymond Yi from uh, DHL Asia Pacific, I believe, he's uh, uh, asking what do you think are the reasons for this timeline and of what significance in your opinion is the GFC? Uh, in that context. And the second one comes from uh, Prof. Alan Chong from, from RSIS. And he asked specifically, because you're based, based in Australia at the Lowy Institute, if you would do uh, a comparative assessment uh, 
uh, on whether quad states are willing to engage with the Belgian Road Initiative uh, on the competitive developmental uh, development game, um, uh, because the BRI is not going away, even though it has suffered some some setbacks. So perhaps you would like to like to go and answer these two questions uh, uh, first, if that's sure. okay. Great. Thanks for thanks for those questions. Um, really interesting points. I guess uh, when I'm talking about the GFC. As, as a turning point, it's kind of like the tipping point after you've had a, a long succession of factors and finally this is the, this is the, the point that it tips over it. Um, you have a lot of factors playing, playing um, going along in the background in, in years prior, the accession to the WTO, China is still very much in factory Asia mode, uh, those free trade agreements that we talked about earlier. Uh, and also just the fact that China did much better economically in that GFC period than um, than other big geo economic players like the US uh, and the EU. And the other thing I think is important just to, to put that chart into context and, the, and the, the trade, the turn to trade, is that this is in relative terms in terms of how much, where the countries traded more with the US or with China. So there is a, a level story here in that countries, of course, were growing in their trade with China, but also important to note that this is in relative terms. So yes, the GFC is a tipping point, not in and of itself necessarily, although, although it played a part, um, not the sole reason, but also the accumulation of factors uh, before that point. Uh, turning now to the question about the quad, um, I'm, I'm not a national security specialist and I know that that's really what the quad is about and in terms of those joint military exercises. Um, so I can't speak to their specific uh, uh, their specific actions. But bilaterally, you can see that Australia and India are making noises about um, greater economic cooperation uh, in terms of trade. And D Japan has long been involved in, in, in the development sphere separate to the BRI anyway. But then you see uh, the US with its blue dot. Uh, what was, was that what it was a few years ago, a couple of year or two ago when they came out? So it's hard to see them uh, acting in conjunction with the BRI, so to speak. Uh, I mean, and from an Australian point of view, you have a, a Victorian state government signing a, an MOU um, with the BRI, and then you have the federal government on top saying, no, you can't do that. Uh, so it's hard to, it's hard if, if Australia can't even decide for itself internally, it's hard to, for me to see uh, the Quad uh, as, a, as a security grouping engaging with that. But uh, I'm sure national security experts and people who know more about the Quad could also have a few things to say on that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Su Yun uh, specifically by uh, my colleague Joel Lang, also from uh, uh, RSIS here with the Center of Multilateralism Studies. He asks uh, uh, Su Yun, he asks you how resilient are the new trade patterns that have formed amid the pandemic? Um, he believes there were massive disruption and uh, um, um, the question is, are those new trade patterns uh, durable and, and how resistant are they to new shocks? Uh, perhaps uh, you're willing to answer, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Happy to. Thank you, Joel. Um, I, I guess uh, your question can be considered in two different dimensions. And the one is still touching on the, you know, the, uh, the shuffling of the global supply chain itself, which is also uh, closely linked to the uh, uh, Fred's earlier uh, question. So I, I guess uh, uh, many private sectors, you know, they're, they're trying to diversify uh, 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 their locations in global supply chain from China uh, to other countries uh, and showing the uh, China plus one model. But uh, uh, one thing I'd like to emphasize here is that, you know, regardless uh, of the, you know, the uh, uh, intentions of the government, uh, actually it is in you know, a private uh, firms, you know, that will make a final decisions. So, you know, Japanese, uh, Japan's case was very successful because, you know, they have started, you know, the strategy similar to China plus one uh, over the past two decades. And then um, now, you know, they clearly know where to move and then, you know, they have built a really good relations with ASEAN countries. They know about, you know, the capital and the labor here. So that's the reason why, you know, the Japanese firms has been successfully, you know, diversified and that uh, mitigate the uh, negative impact of the, uh, supply uh, uh, chain uh, shock here. But uh, the contrasting case you know, come from the US economies. You know, uh, all of us know that Trump has been trying to implement a big coupling strategy and then saying all the American firms need to get back to America. But the unlike you know, Japanese counterparts, American firms, you know, 70% uh, of them, they're insisting that you know, we are, are seeking for the uh, restoration of the relation between the two countries because we do not want to get back to America. So I, I guess, you know, uh, 
these uh, trade patterns, uh, on the one hand, will be shaped by the decisions of the uh, private firms at the business level, but the, their links and the, uh, to the uh, government industrial strategy are, so imp are important. And then the second part of the you know, trade patterns will be shaped by the uh, regional trade orders itself. And as we have discussed, there is a, a strong waves of the RTAs and FTAs. But uh, one thing I like to emphasize here is that the recent uh, RCEP, for instance, this is not about further uh, liberalization because in the case of the ASEAN economy, 70% of the you know, goods, they are already getting you know, 0% the tariff. It's more about the setting the rules and then uh, reduce the uh, non-tariff measures in terms of the rules of origin. But uh, at the same time, you know, that we need to consider that this in RCEP framework is being overlapped with other existing FDAs, which could uh, cause, you know, uh, 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 complications in the uh, case of the trade dispute among uh, uh, trade partners. And uh, the last point will be, of course, the uh, geopolitical implications of the trade order itself. I guess this is not the intention of the ASEAN economies, but the many uh, people consider RCEP has been led by China. At the same time, you know, TPP, you know, before the US withdrawal of the deal, TPP was regarded as a sort of you know, Obama administration's containment policy. So in other words, uh, RCEP, once it was agreed, there is a, a sort of a geopolitical implication saying that the China is playing a huge role in building these in you know, liberalizing uh, trade orders. So I guess you know those are the three things we might consider to analyze the pattern. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, thank you on behalf of uh, uh, Joel. Um, there are here's a question that is addressed to uh, Alisa and Alitza together, but I believe that uh, probably it's more in Alitza's. Uh, uh, portfolio, but if you, if you want, of course, Elisa, you can step in too, of course. Um, Kathy Cole, she didn't let us in on where she's uh, where, where she's from or what who she's affiliated with, but she asked a great question to better rebuild the connectivities. Uh, I guess she means international uh, international exchange in general in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, do you think ASEAN can play a role in terms of vaccines uh, recognition? So I guess what she's after is an answer as to whether ASEAN can um, um, approve vaccines as a for generals all of Southeast Asia. I I presume that this is what she's asking. Um, whether ASEAN can have a role in this. So perhaps uh, Alisa, do you want to start and, and have a shot at this, and then Alisa jump in if she has some if she wants to contribute as well. Is this for is this for me or Alisa? For both of you. <laughs> Who was talking about vaccines? Because uh, I think she should yeah. have the first shot, okay, and uh, I can step in. Uh, sure. So the question about uh, multilateral mechanism for vaccines, um, I think, in uh, speaking quite plainly here, in a, in a nice world where. Uh, ASEAN was, was able to, we, we talked about before about how ASEAN was not of such a binding nature. And I think we're already at a stage where individual countries are making their own decisions about approving vaccines and how they'll distribute them and where they're sourcing them from. So given that that's the starting point, it, I, I think it's, it can be, it may, might be quite difficult to coordinate beginning from that rather than uh, possibly, you know, an alternative situation where ASEAN may have played a, a bigger role from the beginning before uh, these individual Individual stories began to play out. Uh, so that's that's um, my rather realist view uh, off the top of my head, but I don't know if Alisa has any other thoughts to, to add to that. Well, I don't know how ASEAN can really, they can encourage uh, more transparency, um, if that's the issue here, uh, in terms of, because that's what I understood from that question. Um, don't do I see it? Um, it talks about transparency and record. Uh, yeah, lack of transparency. Um, I think it can make suggestions, but it cannot really make the countries um, 
they can encourage the connectivity and possibly few states can be a pilot and work on this and encourage others. But I don't see this to be across all Asian countries implemented um, at once. So this would be gradual, um, some kind of a gradual activity. That's my view. Perhaps if I can, if I can quickly leave a comment on this question too. Uh, as unfair as comparisons of ASEAN and the European Union usually are, but the EU has a has a mechanism for recognition of of, of uh, pharmaceuticals, right? So of um, uh, vaccines here in this particular case. And although the nation states would be uh, uh, would be legally allowed to uh, um, uh, um, recognize nationally whatever vaccine they want, and some countries like Hungary has uh, have done so, but they have agreed to do it on the EU basis. And surprise, surprise. It has been all a big mess up uh, uh, at the beginning, and uh, Britain, after they left the EU, have been handed their first win by uh, being able to vaccinate much faster than uh, the countries of the European Union. So, uh, not blaming the European Union here, but basically stating what a very complex bureaucratic uh, process that is to recognize a vaccine. So, I would think ASEAN is neither interested nor uh, ready to 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 do so. Even the European Union struggles quite significantly uh, uh, with this multilateral recognition of, of vaccines uh, and procurement, by the way, also. Okay, uh, uh, never mind. We move on to a question from somebody who has not identified himself, but um, uh, Mr. Anonymous attendee is asking how can nations legitimately question China or challenge China on issues such as human rights and others um, uh, without antagonizing them? resulting in severe trade impacts such as those Australia is currently going through. So that's not directly related to COVID, but perhaps somebody wants to have a shot at this um, um, uh, repercussions on uh, trade repercussions, I guess, on uh, uh, criticisms of China. If somebody wants to go. Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the first stab at it. I think uh, the short answer is if there, if there was one obvious solution to this, Australia would probably be trying to do it right now. Uh, and uh, But the other point that I would make here is that the, the trade impacts, they, they, they are obviously very severe for the, for the industries uh, suffering uh, the, the, uh, from the economic coercion or the sanctions or, or, or the trade measures, whatever you want to call them. But in, in, in aggregate, uh, we have yet to see uh, those trade effects flow through to growth in a significant way. Um, so I would just I, I would just make that note that even though of course it's 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 of great importance to those wine producers, to the beef and barley producers in Australia, uh, we haven't seen we haven't seen these measures have a meaningful or a very large impact on on the aggregate economy yet. Um, so it's just an important frame um, to to look at that through. But if there was a if there was a one liner answer, I think Australia would be doing it by now, unfortunately. <laughs> Does anyone else want to jump in, or uh, if not, may um, I add a little bit? Of course, please. Yeah. So the, this is not uh, uh, directly about trade, but uh, I guess the question is also uh, 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 dealing with the human rights issues and uh, how countries can speak up about the human rights issues in China. I guess you know these are very sensitive, and uh, you know, except for a few countries such as the U.S. or the U.K., it is you know very not U.K. the BBC, I would say. It is, you know, relatively rare or, or for us to see national governments like, you know, uh, uh, raise their voices about human rights issues in China. But that said, I think, you know, there have been new trends in the side of the consumers. You know, for instance, there has been some suspicions of the, you know, uh, forced labor in uh, Xinjiang Uyghur. And then the consumers, you know, they're organizing lobby, you know, against private firms such as Nike or Coca-Cola and the saying that, these sectors are really need to be you know, conscious about you know the human rights issues in China, and I guess you know that is one of the you know, most recent trend uh, organized by uh, at the interest group level or in the consumer level. Sign this up here. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's an here's a very interesting question from Jaya Menon, who identifies that. Uh, who identifies a new risk in reshoring. So instead of China plus one, in terms of uh, diversification, 
um, there is a trend to reshore. So uh, buy, uh, uh, buy domestic, uh, domestically produced uh, goods. And uh, Jaya Menon identifies this as a new role of, as a new form of protectionism and asks whether there is any role for regional or even international organizations uh, that can address these kind of um, uh, uh, a new, new form of protectionism. Um, yeah, probably one for Suyun or, or for, for Alisa as well, if, if you want to go. Uh, Alisa, would you like to go first or should I start? Yeah. Oh, is this from... Oh, I'm sorry, I mean the Alisa or Alitza. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to take first, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, you feel free to kick off um, and then Alisa can go afterwards. I, I'll, I'll have a think first. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much you know, for the uh, great question. Uh, personally, I don't think you know, this you know, by domestic or by American rhetoric is completely new. And then you know, if you see political remarks you know, from congressmen or president in the United States, there are almost like you know, cyclical patterns you know, uh, that emphasize the economic importance of domestic employment and then the help to rise investment in domestic firms and then getting the firms to their own country. Uh, it would be very ideal if regional organizations or the WTO could uh, address all of this source of new protectionism. But unfortunately, I don't think you know, that is the case because the one of the amazing features of the WTO was the uh, dispute settlement mechanism. But uh, it means that the government, you know, they need to file a case and then go through a, a huge procedure, you know, to resolve the dispute in the first stage. But uh, in many cases, you know, by domestic, I guess, you know, they are allowed, you know, at least to a certain degree as a, a domestic industrial strategy. That's the one thing uh, we can consider. And then secondly, I, I think, you know, when we think about these issues of the international trade, Significant portions of the trade issues you know, are determined by the interactions between government and the domestic actors. So uh, that means that even if you know the we, we see these huge trends of the trade liberalization at the regional level or at the global level, at the very end, at the implementation stage, uh, there should be some sort of agreement between domestic actors who got pretty vulnerable by uh, increasing trade exposure and the government want to maintain certain level of economic openness. So I guess that this is one of the you know, uh, uh, chronic patterns of the ASEAN way of a trade liberalization. They're making a lot of you know, liberal commitment, but that they have to revise in you know, a plan again and again because there is a, a lag between the promise and the implementation of the strategy. So here, I guess maybe we need to think about how to compensate the losers of international trade and then what government can do for those who will lose by trade and at the same time they can ma uh, maintain an ideal level of trade liberalization. So thank you. Okay, anyone else who wants to have a go at this question? Yeah, I can now step in. I, I think I agree that this is not new. And I think in short term terms uh, to help the local businesses uh, and, you know, and farms, this is not bad, not as like protectionism, but really to help revive um, the supply from and, and sustain the local production or local produce. I think that is important even for the psyche of the communities. But I agree with the long term, there should be some discussions. So the so-called protectionism in some of these measures doesn't become a bit too far that, you know, the competition is still preserved. But I think it's a short to maybe even medium term solution and encouragement under the umbrella of helping um, with the lockdowns or closed borders. I think that's not too bad. Okay, I'm so sorry. I just had some microphone issues once again. I apologize. Uh, my apologies. Okay, let's move on uh, to more questions. Uh, Jansen Kalamita is asking. He's from the uh, Center of, 
uh, for national law at the uh, University of Singapore. And he's asking, he's referring to ASEP and uh, CPTPP, the successor of TPP, uh, in terms of standard setting. Um, does ASEP suggest that China has only limited ambitions uh, for standard setting in the region, noting that it is a lot less uh, complex uh, than CPTPP, the originally the US uh, uh, agreement uh, on, on several issues, uh, rules of origin and so forth, labor protection and so forth. And then to follow up on this question, he also asked us the participation of ASEAN countries in both in both agreements indicate that ASEAN's, uh, ASEAN's continued role as a standard taker rather than uh, a standard maker. Who wants to go have a go at this? Anyone, volunteers? Perhaps there's one thing that is necessary to point out uh, why, why you guys still uh, think of who wants to have a go at this first is that ASEP, I'm not sure if he's implying this, but just to clarify that ASEP is actually not a China, a Chinese agreement, right? That, chi that ASEP is, is de facto an, an ASEAN agreement and not a Chinese agreement. So while it is true that China, of course, had a great influence in ASEP, uh, and was a very, from, from what I understand, a very active participant in asset negotiations and pushing for it. It's originally, I'm not, uh, I'm not 100% sure if I get the dates wrong, but I think it dates back to like 2011 or so of the ASEAN summit where they uh, uh, agreed or uh, agreed on the idea of, of um, unifying those ASEAN plus one agreements they had. So ASEAN really is uh, uh, an ASEAN led, uh, conceived and led uh, agreement. Uh, not a Chinese agreement as such. But regardless of this, perhaps somebody wants to have a go at this question. Maybe I can add uh, one more point for the RCEP. Uh, I guess, you know, the uh, question has already uh, got a, a, a correct insight about the differences between RCEP and the CPTPP. There is in a common agreement that RCEP is a much weaker deal compared to CPTPP in terms of the you know, uh, rules and setting and then, as uh, discussed earlier, the RCEP's liberalization level is not that high because, you know, all of these trading partners, they had a series of, you know, trade liberalizations in different RTAs over the past decade. But that said, I would say that the RCEP will provide a really important uh, foundation for economic cooperation. Because if you look at, you know, uh, those member countries, you know, there or some of GDP portion is more than 30% of the world GDP. And at the same time, you know, it includes a lot of, you know, bilateral relations that have not been getting along really well, for instance, you know, China and uh, uh, Japan. Now they're within the single framework. So maybe, you know, RCEP will provide a venue for countries who had in a previous dispute uh, to develop further their economic cooperation and relations. Thank you. Anyone else wants, want to chip in on this or should I, should I move on? Okay. Okay, then I move on. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Li Jian uh, asking um, regarding the role of middle powers here in this region, um, specifically, um, is the U.S.-China rivalry, in the intensified U.S.-China rivalry, pressuring Asian countries, those middle powers, I guess, to to choose sides, uh, especially referring to South Korea and Australia, and um, will they choose sides? Uh, uh, will they choose sides, or, or I guess, or will they choose? Uh, will they start, try to say neutral and put more emphasis on multilateralism in general? Well, I guess for Australia, we have already seen that they have already chosen a side, I guess, in, in, a, in a sense. But perhaps somebody somebody smarter than, than myself want to have a have a go. Maybe, Alisa, you want to talk about Australia? Yeah, I, I can comment. Um, yes, they will choose a side, but the side will not be United States or China, but multilateralism, because Australia wants coordinated action, and European Union also wants to deal with uh, Co coordinated action. So it is about preservation of multilateralism and, you know, supporting everything from United Nations through all the regional frameworks. Australia is already uh, has a very elaborate uh, roadmap of working with ASEAN, specifically a document that was uh, published by government in October 2020. Uh, and I think that's the choice Australia is making. 
not to, you know, there is there that tension or this choice between US and China, that debate, academic debate is taking place in Australia all the time. But specifically when it comes to COVID and response, I think it is about multilateralism and not focused on specific countries. I think that's right, um, especially in regards to the pandemic. Uh, in terms of a military alliance, of course, Australia has already chosen the US's side. That is, that's a given to begin with. And uh, for a long time, it seemed like Australia could could have a uh, have its cake and eat it too, uh, in terms of maintaining its economic relationship with China uh, as well as this uh, as well as this alliance with the US. Uh, and I and I think the from here anyway it seems it's not that you're going to tilt completely one way or the other in terms of choosing sides and i would suspect this is the case for many uh other other states in the region where you do your best to hedge and you do your best to, to get your wins where you can and try to maximize on on all sides so i don't think it's a, a binary question often about which side are you going to choose but more that in different um different arenas you're going to you're going to lean more this way or this way uh so i think there's a, a bit of nuance in that as well okay thank you very much so we are uh, out of time now almost but let us uh, uh let us have one more uh, let us answer one more question and this one is directly addressed to alitza so um, uh, from Alan Chong, from uh, the head of the Center for Multilateralism Studies here at RSIS, and uh, he's asking, relating to Alitza's benign view, uh, as he calls it, of ASEAN under COVID-19 conditions. And this is specifically about the coup, the recent coup in, 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 in Myanmar and Indonesia's pressure uh, to have an ASEAN voice, um, I guess, on this, on, on this issue. Uh, so he, this is basically two questions, right? Uh, he's asking, do you, uh, Alitza, think that this is a replay of Jakarta's independence vis-a-vis uh, -vis ASEAN's collective non-interference rule seen in the 1970s over the Cambodia issue and also the Asian financial crisis? And B, do you think that uh, uh, under Brunei's current chairmanship, uh, Indonesia is showing uh, Brunei the way, to put it in, a, <laughs> in, 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 in most friendly terms, uh, in that sense. So if you want to have a go, that gives you the final word. Uh, in As short as uh, this complex question can be answered, please. Thank you, Alan. Uh, greetings and uh, appreciate this uh, not easy question. Uh, wouldn't expect anything less. Uh, well, I actually think that Indonesian um, Retna Marsudi and her speech that is exactly what we require when we see the countries are uh, affiliated with charters and the charter from ASEAN, as you know, Article 1, I think it's Section 7, says it specifically we have to um, observe good governance, rule of law, and there is also a reference, I think, to um, democracy and, and protect the rights and freedoms. So. This is something that we hope will happen, uh, whether it comes from Indonesia right now. I, I think Indonesia always was more confident, even with participation in bigger frameworks beyond ASEAN. Uh, but as well as I understand that Vivian Palakrishnan um, from Singapore sided uh, with Redno Marsudi in the statements. So Singapore also made a declaration Another thing that I noticed in her speech was that um, there was a reference that non-interference will not be revoked, that it will be observed. This is about constructive dialogue. And also, it was about the welfare of people. If we look at the situation, how the pandemic was handled in Myanmar, you can see that a lot of the assessments, comparative assessments, are talking about people being extremely vulnerable. And I think if, if we are trying to do some sort of um, people, uh, like help to people, uh, this, this measure is necessary. I understand the Brunei's chair also had similar declaration. It might have come after. Um, I don't necessarily comment whether they're passive uh, in February or not in this regard. Um, Obviously, some countries are more bold, but 
I don't, I don't, I cannot comment right now whether Indonesia is trying to prove a point to Brunei in terms of passiveness, uh, but something had to be done. Somebody had to remind there is the charter and it is expected. So I think everybody's alarmed by this particular instance, considering how vulnerable and unprepared the healthcare system is in Myanmar. And, and I think this can escalate further, or considering there's other issues in the country already that have not been dealt with for years. So um, in terms of non-interference, I don't see that would be uh, revoked. I just think this is a call for action in terms of um, uh, resolving the situation as possible, as fast as possible. Nobody wants to see this situation right now. Yeah, I think we can all uh, unite around this this final statement for sure. Uh, so with this, we've come to an end. Uh, only five minutes over time. Uh, I, I think this is pretty decent timekeeping. Thank you all for uh, your great presentations. Uh, I learned a lot. If our goal was today to address multilateralism and trade and COVID all in one go, I think we've more than accomplished this. Thank you uh, very much. So on behalf of our audience, I give you a very very loud clap and on behalf of myself a very uh, a, a deep sincere thank you uh, very much uh, you've all enlightened us quite substantially and then uh, greetings to australia greetings to singapore uh, thank you to our audience please tune in also of course to our speakers please tune into our last uh, edition of our three day web uh, three part web webinar series which will be a week today where we'll be discussing uh, diplomacy, COVID-19 and the future of uh, diplomacy. Uh, same time, one week today, uh, our final part of this webinar series. So thank you very much to all of you for tuning in, for enlightening us and bye-bye. <laughs>